Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Gustavo Santos and I work here as the administrator for the Master of Arts in Leadership, Theology and Society, MALTS for short. Today we're going to uh, listen from two of our students as they tell us uh, what are the reasons and the ways they serve the common good in the work they do in a world that's becoming more and more self-indulgent. Monica Tang works as a reconciliation advisor at the Canadian Coast Guard and she advances partnerships with First Nations governments on behalf of Canadian Coast Guard for marine management. And she is in the first Mouts cohort here at Regent. Austin Malnes uh, works as a grade four teacher and he helps to guide students or the, on their learning journeys at um, Surrey Christian School and Austin is part of the second cohort of the MALTS program here at college, uh, the Regent College. So thank you for being here. Um, so this is how this is gonna work. So we will first hear from our marketplace theology and leadership professor, Dr. Stephen Garber, who will frame the conversation uh, for us by giving us a definition of common good. What does that mean? Then we have a few questions um, to Monica and Austin from us. Um, if time allows, we will have some questions from the audience as well. If you're watching us on YouTube, you can send your, your questions, uh, just putting comments there. We'll be monitoring that. And then we'll have Dr. Garber closing our discussion at the end. And this event uh, is born out of uh, the partnership between the MOUTS program and Regent Exchange which is a fresh expression of Regent College's long-standing commitment to integrative theology that embraces all of life. Regent Exchange is represented today by my colleague, um, Elsie Lowe, who uh, we'll hear from her at the end as well. So it's a pretty straightforward plan. I hope you enjoy. So welcome, Dr. Stephen Garber. On Tuesday night this week, I was leading my class on vocation for Regent students, and typically we read one book per week for the class, so it's diverse literature. It's sometimes it's theologically weighted and born and directed, and other times this past week was a novel by Walker Percy. Uh, we've had a collection of essays written over 2,000 years by people in the church on the nature of vocation, and uh, we do different kinds of reading, and I often bring somebody in to the class via Skype who I think in some ways embodies the conversation for the students. I want them to see that in fact that words can become flesh in honest life, in real life for real people. So um, this past week the work book we had read was The Thanatos Syndrome by Walker Percy, which is the last novel that he wrote in, in his own career as a, as a novelist. I've been deeply apprenticed to him in my life, my thinking about things, and I want my students to learn to read him as well. Um, Thanatos Syndrome is the second novel of Percy's about the same character, a fictional descendant of Sir Thomas More, simply named Tom More, who was a lapsed Catholic in the stories of Love in the Ruins and then Thanatos Syndrome. He is uh, not a very good husband, uh, uh, but a very brilliant physician and sees deeply into the things that are ours as human beings. This particular novel is about coming out of prison for a few years. He's been sentenced for prescribing diet pills to women who persuaded him to do so and, and uh, he was caught for that, and so he's now back practicing as a physician again, and he discovers that his patients actually are just nicer than they used to be when they come to see him, and he just can't figure out why she's this way, why he's this way, and they used to say things like this, now they don't, and they seem to have different kinds of questions and problems, and they just seem to be nicer, really. I'm summing up the story very succinctly for you here. He discovers that um, some enlightened uh, citizens are putting chemicals in the water and uh, the chemicals actually change mind and heart and body and make people simply be nicer than they used to be 
And the great question, the story, is what will Tom Moore do? If you have any memories of the story of Sir Thomas More from centuries ago, remember he was being requested by his good friend, the King of England, to simply sign a statement saying it's okay to get married again. And he wouldn't do it, and the King of England said, well, then off with your head, literally, uh, to his good friend. And this is, of course, hundreds of years later, and Tom Moore is who he is in these stories, and he decides to step into the mess of the story, into the mess of history, into the complexity of human life under the sun. Uh, you see, it's a question of what will he do knowing what he knows, uh, which is the heart of every honest account of vocation, actually. Uh, it's a story about the nature of the common good of two, as well, isn't it? Of here we are, we live together, it's a co corporate communal life we've, we have together in this particular town, and our water supply is for all of us, and, and somebody's done what? And they're nicer, but wouldn't we want them to be nicer? And of course, it's a deeper question. Uh, in the book about, so what's it mean to be nicer in the world, and what's our responsibility for who we are and for our neighbors in the world? And you see, these are the questions of the common good always and everywhere. I invited my friend Todd Dethridge to join us for most of an hour in a Skype conversation. Uh, my wife and I have always lived this way, to choose a neighbor before you choose a house. So here at Regent, it means we live a block away from Regent College, but back in Virginia, we lived among friends who had long been neighbors who were friends as well, quite purposefully. One is Todd Dethridge, who worked with the U.S. State Department for many years. He was Condoleezza Rice's chief of staff for her think tank at the State Department, traveled all over the world with her. When that finished, he decided to form the Telos Group. And the Telos Group takes up an almost intractable problem in the world today. It's the problem between Israelis and Palestinians. And uh, most people in the church and the world, all over the world, literally, want to say, well, you have to choose one over the other, don't you? because it's a zero-sum game after all. You can't actually be for both because both couldn't be right, could they? How could they both be right, really? And so whether it's Canada, whether it's the US, whether it's Brazil, whether it's Hong Kong, Christians typically are willing to think about it, but they're willing, they are disposed to say, you see, you have to choose, don't you? And my friend Todd has said, no, there are two histories and two hopes, and both have to be honored. I've served on his board for many years, and he's a close friend and neighbor, and I asked him to come and just talk with us a little bit about the morass of his own work, the mess of the world he's chosen to work in, the complexity of what common good might mean for people who live in the Bethlehems of the 21st century. Um, this place, of course, of historic, you know, shalom, uh, this historic place where we remember peace, you know, upon earth, goodwill to men and women all over the face of the earth. And Todd, of course, goes here literally every month of his life. So he just got back on Saturday for another trip, and he's done 50 trips over the last numbers of years to Israel. Uh, he knows the land very, very well. I asked him the question, why do you care about this, Todd? Because um, that's often been my own deeper question. So when you look at the mess, at the difficulty of how hard things are, why would you choose to step in then? Why would you choose to actually enter in with persistence and steadfastness. Why, in the language I have come to love, and it means almost the world to me, why do you see yourself implicated for love's sake in the way the world is and ought to be? Now, we could talk a lot more about this, but you're not here to hear me so much. I'm framing this as a conversation, though, for our two good friends who are part of the MALTS program, because you see, the Masters in Leadership, Theology, and Society is a program brought into being to address these questions globally. Uh, in North America, in Latin America, in Asia, in Africa, Australia, Europe. Our students are part of these places in the world. And they've come to us in an unusual way because Regents offered a new pedagogy, a new wineskin, pedagogically speaking, to allow students who are at work in the world, who literally, for all kinds of really good reasons, can't come to Vancouver for two years. But they do live in Hong Kong or Singapore or you know, Washington, D.C., or they live in Lagos, Nigeria, or they live in you know, Timbuktu. And they are real, able to come in and think together for two years about the relationship between leadership, theology, and society. And we've asked two good friends, two trusted friends, to come and talk about these things with us. So it's my privilege and my own grace to allow you to meet Austin and Monica and they have questions which they've thought about and are going to talk to us about for the next most of an hour. So thank you for coming, and we'll talk some more, okay?
Thank you, Steve. So I'll start with Monica. Monica, the issues of climate change and reconciliation with indigenous peoples, um, which deeply affect the flourishing of many, were at the forefront of the recent election. In light of this, my question for you is, why does the work you do matter? And how do you serve the flourishing of all the parties involved? Thank you for that um, question, Gustavo. And I'm also uh, honored to be here today on the traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh uh, peoples. So there's a lot there in, your, um, in that question. So I'm just going to answer it in parts. And certainly these are deep, substantive questions that we probably won't do justice to in the 10 minutes that we have each. So I'll just um, outline some brief thoughts about each of those sections. So let's start with... Um, You've, um, you've raised two topics, both climate change and reconciliation with indigenous peoples. Um, those two topics, I, in my view, reflect a area that is a need for redemption and restoration in, uh, in several different ways. So let's start with um, climate change. That's a very sort of present uh, topic that is both um, has ecological, economic, social dimensions affecting flourishing. And um, as we can sort of, as what we know from um, climate science and uh, the reason for, you know, the changing climate, the contribution of greenhouse gases, it also points to a, um, this being an outcome of excessive consumption, um, sort of the proliferation of uh, very like of lifestyles that may not be sustainable within the current planetary limits that we have, and really a tension between how do we um, how do we continue sort of like development and flourishing along with the responsibilities of ecological stewardship and living within a world where there are ecological limits. And you know where we find ourselves currently now is a result of some poor stewardship of um, the atmospheric ecosystems um, that um, that you know protect and uh, provide a lot of atmospheric stability that we enjoy and appreciate, but also the poor management and stewardship of uh, you know vital areas like forest ecosystems and like oceans that also, in addition to having inherent worth and dignity as creation, but are also you know va provide valuable ecosystem services in the areas of um, carbon dioxide and greenhouse gas uh, absorption that um, you know stabilize the uh, stabilize the climate. So those are that's just sort of that's some of the issues around sort of climate change and why that matters. I'll touch very briefly upon um, the concept of indigenous reconciliation. And thanks to the work of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, there is a growing and wider public awareness around um, Canada's relationship with its indigenous peoples and a growing realization that where we are now is because of the fact that there is a realization that Canada was not and is not a just society for, um, for with respect to um, the indigenous peoples who we uh, that we live with in our in, in the land that we live with here. So that's a very brief overview of two topics that are very in depth. And uh, let's go on to the concept of linking it to work. So um, as we've been studying and talking about in MALTS. Um, work is an opportunity for us to co-participate um, with God for his purposes in the world. Um, human beings have this commandment from the very beginning of scripture to, um, to serve and to steward and to protect, and work is a way for us to do that. We've been reading about um, Abraham Kuyper and um, his you know, theological perspectives about Christ's rule over all spheres of life, whether it's at at work or you know in the office at church in culture in politics in society and the lordship of Christ over all of um, you know, over all of these spheres so I see my work as an opportunity to contribute to horizontal reconciliation um, particularly with indigenous peoples and the work that I do but also on a broader scale um, contributing to reconciliation with creation and thinking about ways that um, our collective efforts, the government of Canada and um, with indigenous governments, how we can better steward the, um, th this particular area that we've been given sort of, that we've been given responsibility to steward. 
Um, I take my cues more specifically from sort of two passages in the Bible that have been very inspirational to me and have sort of sustained me throughout this work. And the first was in 2 Corinthians that talks about um, Christians being the ministers of reconciliation. So the word reconciliation is you know, right there in the text of the scripture. And the second is um, Ephesians 2. And uh, it talks about sort of Christ breaking down the barriers of hostility. He was referring to Jews and Gentiles, but I sort of have thought about this more broadly with respect to Christ breaking down the barriers and divisions between ethnic groups. And I think about this a lot as I've been working at the intersection of both sort of Canadian settler society and working with um, indigenous peoples who have, um, yeah, who have had a different history and have had like a different culture. Um, so more specifically, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis <laughs> at Canadian Coast Guard, I think about my work as an opportunity to advance partnerships, to think about ways that we can use power responsibly, to use power collaboratively, to, um, you know, build partnerships around marine safety, marine management. You know, we live in what, the second busiest port in Canada, so the, um, so the implications, I, I would argue, are quite substantive for getting this right and uh, doing this well because it's worthwhile and um, work as an opportunity now that we have a growing and more widespread societal understanding about reconciliation to forge you know new paths new partnerships to uh, to steward our you know marine environment and our oceans in a in a way that is hopefully better for uh, for both people and for the creation so there was a lot there, and then I think the third, the third aspect of the question was around flourishing. And I thought that um, use of that word was very intentional. It's a very malt type of uh, vocabulary word that we use a lot. So I thought about what does it mean to be intentional? And I remember in one of our readings, um, there was an example of the man who worked in the, who was the, the man who was the insurance broker who, when he was drafting insurance policies with thinking about his, his clients and, the fam and their families and how his work would impact them, um, would, would impact them. So I forget which book this was, but um, it was something recent. So if I sort of apply that similar mindset and I think about flourishing in my day-to-day -day tasks, then the questions that I ask myself are, how do we creatively you know, share power in, uh, in, the various, you know, in all the various different areas of work that I work in? So maybe I'm participating in a technical working group with, a, um, with staff from a First Nations government. I may be suggesting language that goes into a contribution agreement or a co-management agreement. I may be thinking about um, how can I be thinking about flourishing as I'm drafting like a briefing memo or like communications that will go to other people inside the agency? And being intentional about, um, about flourishing in each of those daily tasks, I think is a way to, uh, to, honor, to, yeah, to honor God in our work and to honor God in, um, in how we think about how we relate to other people. And I also um, take some inspiration as I think about the parallels between, you know, Jesus calls us to be peacemakers, and I think about that in the context of working in conflict resolution. So a lot of the um, active skills that people have called soft skills over the years, but I don't, I would argue are not soft skills that are at all, they're actually quite crucial. Um, so skills such as being able to listen actively, to put ourselves in the shoes of other people, to um, develop empathy, to understand, uh, sort of understand some of their underlying concerns or beliefs, hopes, fears that may be behind, um, you know, statements that they're saying or, um, or you know, written or <laughs> written statements or things that they're saying. Um, and thinking about that with the view of interest-based negotiations, how can we craft an agreement that serves the interests of all the parties involved? I um, have become more convinced over the past couple of years that these are very important skills as we live in a world that is increasingly more polarized, that where um, it is increasingly easier to just you know, huddle with the people who uh, who think similarly to you do, and to and it's easier to dismiss other people and other people's perspectives. So I think that these skills needed for conflict resolution and peace building are very aligned to um, to to flourishing. And I also think about the long term view. Um, I know that government isn't like business and we may not operate in terms of quarters, but there is there can still be short-term thinking, particularly being a public servant and thinking about um, election cycles that last every four years. And I remember a couple of years ago being at a treaty table with um, the Stolo people whose traditional territories are out in the Fraser Valley. And they were sharing with us their worldview about um, these treaty negotiations that, you know, for 
the clause for the words that they're negotiating, how we'll craft the agreement and the craft the treaty together. They're not just thinking about the next four years. They're not thinking about this generation. They're thinking about seven generations forward into the future. So hearing that cultural perspective and contribution, I think, has enriched um, at least my experience in being a public servant. And my hope is that in flourishing, we also thinking about we also think about the long term implications and the long term perspectives. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. Austin. You can see Austin here. You can see Austin there. It's a good, good thing. So as you teach uh, your great force in the classroom, you are inevitably involved in shaping the lives of young people. But when we think back to our uh, grade four experience, um, it may be full of memorization of multiplication tables or or trying to recite historical facts, or trying to remember elements, uh, chemical elements, and everything. So how, how do you see your vocation contributing to the common good as you teach students about math, or, or science, or history? Um, once again, thank you for the privilege of being here. Uh, this is a bit of an interesting question for me. Um, when I looked at Monica's question, I have ideas about what her job entails and what her day-to-day -day life looks like at work, but I really have no clue. Um, all of you who are here uh, know um, what it was like to sit in a classroom at some point. Uh, and so you all had teachers that um, were given requirements either by uh, the school or the government about what they were supposed to teach, uh, and your teachers uh, engaged in that on their own in a certain way, and then the way that they um, ran their classroom um, gives you a, a vision of what, of what they feel about what they're teaching or what their requirements are. And even though most of us haven't been in a grade four classroom for a, a large number of years, it wouldn't take you very long to walk into a classroom and look around and pretty much be able to pinpoint what that teacher believes about what they're teaching or what they believe about their students. It's, it's generally blatantly obvious for most people um, without, without too many minutes um, that's there. And so what do we do with, with that? Um, it's an interesting question. I got into education, um, actually bluntly, I wasn't sure. People told me I'd be good at it, so we gave it a shot, and it turns out I'm not too bad sometimes. <laughs> But each classroom contains a different type of life, and that life is a spectrum. Um, it, it looks different when students walk into a classroom and they sit down in their desk and they put their heads down, they do their work and they do things, and that might be a good type of life for that classroom. You might not necessarily agree with students that sit down and quietly do their work, um, but that's what that class might need. Um, but when we talk about the common good, I think sometimes the assumption is that education in general is for the common good because we see studies that say, hey, when we look at more educated populations, there's um, less prevalent um, diseases, their housing is better, uh, gross domestic products are up. Um, and we look at economical numbers of education and say, of course, these things are better for the common good. But every Ed, every educational institute looks at learning differently and the way that they view learning actually contributes to whether the communities that they're living in are fully flourishing or not. Um, I've been involved and um, done some study around flourishing communities in general and there's things like there's metrics for what communities as a whole look like, what they can what they contain when they are when they're flourishing Things like the good, the just, the beautiful, the sustainable, the prosperous, the true. When communities encompass those things and work at doing them well, the communities flourish. The common good is at the center of all those things. And yet when we talk about education, often we only focus on the prosperous. How do we make money with what we're teaching students? 
how do students leave the school and become actually for a long time the actual wording in the government from the from the education minister was um, contributing members of society but it was very undergirded with this idea of how do we not pay for you to be alive um, and so that's bluntly where education has sat for a long time how do we ensure that you leave here and that you actually pay your taxes and have a home um, that you're not user, like taking other people's money. And so it leaves a question of when we talk about things like the beautiful, like can we see the beautiful in mathematical functions? Like if I look at how oxygen and uh, th like the transpiration of the water cycle through trees and I look at the chemical buildup of that, can I see beauty in that? And when you ask that question to any student regardless, Generally, the answer is like it's X's and O's and dashes and hydrogen chains and whatever. But that is abs it's beautiful, it's gorgeous. It provides in a way that we don't understand. Um, I saw some artwork by an artist that actually all their art is done on the chemical reactions of things. So they have paintings of jellyfish, but if you look really, really closely, it's actually the chemical makeup that makes jellyfish why they sting. So it's the poison and the painting is painted all with the, the biological makeup. They're beautiful, it's amazing. Um, what is sustainable or was sustainable when we look at things like social history? Um, what functions of society are still sustainable now and which ones do we need to leave because they're not? Um, and they, they, the reasons why they're there are different. They may have thought they were sustainable but when we look back at it, are they still? Does that contribute to our society as a whole? And so one of the practices that I have in my classroom is to, when I look at curriculum, is to kind of chunk it up into three different things. We look at knowledge you need to know for 60 minutes, 60 days, and 60 years. And as much as a teacher, I wanna like admit that everything I do is good for 60 years. That's just categorically untrue. <laughs> Um, but it helps give, perspe give perspective on what we're doing um, because really the, the cycle of education has been learn this thing, do this product to show you've learned this thing. And then when we receive that product as teachers, I will give you an arbitrary grade on how I feel like you've done. Sometimes there's a rubric and sometimes there's not. And then I will give it back to you and say, okay, here, it's yours. And most students, regardless of what age you are, you take that and it goes right in the trash. It's a dumpster project. So one, that's not economically or ecologically sustainable. <laughs> but it's actually not knowledge sustainable either. Right? And so when we look at what we do as teachers for the common good, we actually, I have to consider those things a lot. Um, how much, and it depends on, then it dictates how much time I spend on it. If it's a 60 minute project, okay, yes, it's a skill that we need to know, but it's not necessarily uh, how much blood, sweat, and tears do we want to put into it. Uh, we have a project that my class is working on right now where they use a scratch board to like take away material to create an image instead of um, putting material onto a paper to create an image. And we talk a little bit about how you can't just sort of take your pin and your scratch board and start going because you can't put the material back. You kind of have to sit and stew in it for a little bit before you actually start. Some of the work that comes out of that is absolutely brilliant and I look at it and I'm like, I can't believe a nine-year-old did this. Some of it is like right on par. Like, yeah, that's, that's, that's nine-year-old work. <laughs> but my hope in that is to be blunt, it's a 60 minute project for most of my kids. We do it, they look nice, we put them on the board, their parents get to see them, their classmates and their student mate and their schoolmates get to see them, and they go away. But I'm actually waiting for the day that that conversation of, hey, Mr. Malness, do you remember when we did that scratch board thing and we talked about how we can't put material back that we've taken off? That's changed the way I've looked at something because it's actually there for a reason. I'm not gonna belabor it with nine year olds but it's there because I actually care about that thought in a nine-year-old's brain. I care that in maybe 60 years, that's come back from a student that says, hey, I've been thinking about not being able to put back things we take away. 
and this is what I think is, is about that. And so that, that changes the way I look at things. I have, to, I have to get off the treadmill of a checkbox of work that says, if I don't complete this amount of curricular things, then I am not being responsible as a teacher. And I actually recognize that if I am taking that stance of checking boxes, that I'm actually being reckless as a teacher. Because I'm not taking the time to actually expound things with my students that I believe are important, that I believe need to be around for a long time, that are care, are full of care. Um, one of the things that's kind of set this all off for me is we read um, Dr. Garber's uh, book for our courses this summer. And there's two phrases out of it that have, like if you could open up my head, I'm pretty sure they're like just scratched on the back of my, my brain. And one of the questions was, can you know the world and still love it? And my kind of response in that was, can you know the world and not love it? Um, and I've been talking a little bit about this with a friend of mine. And she asked me, like, well, what if you dig it all up and you, you just don't? And I think this is where the common good comes into play is that the idea of the common good is that we can look at sort of the mess of the world and not love the picture that's there, um, but understand that it's not our responsibility to fix the entire picture, um, but it is our responsibility to engage it. Um, and so what I look for in my classroom is areas that my students can engage the world in a way that they can, they, they can love a portion of it um, a portion that they know that they can affect. And that actually links to uh, the second piece of, out of that book, which is um, kind of a line of thinking that says, if you know about, uh, you have the responsibility to care for. Um, and for a long time, how we viewed what we learned was could we regurgitate it? Not that you cared about it. Um, care implies that you've changed the way that you that you see that, that thing. And so I was trying to think about a really simple way of putting this, and I think the best one I came up with, and I'm gonna be honest with you, it made me giggle, so I kept it, was that when we learn how to count to 20, um, some kids take off their shoes. Because they get to 10 and then realize they've got 10 below, so they take their shoes off. But at some point, when I want to assess, like, if you've learned how to add 10 plus 10, you have to keep your shoes on. Like, the way of, of knowing that you've learned that is that your behavior in response to that arithmetic question has changed. And so when we look at bigger things like Orange Shirt Day, which happened uh, at the beginning of October, how do I engage nine-year-olds with a portion of Canada's history that is shocking and frightening and sad. It's one thing for my students to feel sad about it. That's fine. Educating for the common good means you feel sad for it, but you don't just leave it there. We actually unpack why those things may have happened. What sort of things look like today that we, that we may or may not um, still engage with? Is Orange Shirt Day about the fact that someone wasn't allowed to wear an orange shirt? Or is it actually a deeper piece that we have to look at? I'm not asking grade four kids to go out and, and pick it or, or be, um, or affect change. But if one of my students in one thing says, hey, could we just write a letter to the Kwantlen Nation who's down the road from our school and say, hey, look, we're really sorry your, your people had to go through that. That's not on my curriculum, but am I going to say no? It's allowing students to say, I think I'd like to say this to this person or recognize, I'd like to apologize because I've done this. Um, that, that looking at the whole person as an educational function for the common good takes away this idea that everything goes in the dumpster. And that the only good students are the students that, per, that, can, that have good memories. 
when in reality what we're looking for is education, as educators, as educational institutes, if you believe that learning changes your behavior, then we have to engage the world and let students wrestle with it so they actually know what's good for it. You can't know what's good for something if you haven't been in the grossness of it. And that's done with a wisdom that teachers need to filter, um, but we can't be scared of that. So thank you both. I have a question that is for both of you now. Um, it's really born of both the MALTS vision and existence, but also the Regent Exchange program and why it is here at Regent as well. But it's, it's, it, it's this. Working for the flourishing of others often requires intentionality and effort. As someone in the marketplace, how do you hope the church can continue to support you as you work for the common good? Uh, thanks for the question, Steve. I would, um, I would just sort of draw an example from, uh, from a church that I attended in the past in undergrad, and one of the things that I really appreciated about how the church did um, engage with the members of the congregation who were in the marketplace. And I remember at, um, at this church, the, um, the senior pastor would do a very quick 10-minute sort of interview and overview with a number of people in the congregation who worked in varying different fields ranging from healthcare to social work to sort of manual labor and would ask them about their work, would ask them about their job and would ask them about what they were passionate about and what they were struggling with and what they were challenged by. And, and then at the end of this quick little interview, um, the congregation would just uh, pray for this individual, pray for this person and just sort of commission them into, uh, into the work week. And the range of interviews that, um, you know, that the pastor conducted, I thought, was very encouraging. It showed that there were people who were part of the church community whose work mattered. Their, uh, their work was an opportunity for other people to learn about it. It was an opportunity for people to get to know them beyond just, you know, you're the person that sits in the third pew that, that, I, that I've been going to church with for the past 10 years. So... I remember that was just one practice that resonated with me. I haven't um, had a chance to experience anything like that since, unfortunately. Um, so that, I think, was a very accessible you know, way of acknowledging and affirming that work mattered, that people's day-to-day -day jobs mattered, and, um, and that they, in their roles, mattered. I think for me, I'm going to echo the idea that, that work and labor, regardless of what it is, matters in the kingdom of God is um, vastly underrepresented um, in messages from the church. Um, and for, uh, for people who are maybe not um, inclined as much to dig into their own theology, uh, the message that they hear from the front often is, um, your work only matters if you're talking to your coworkers about Jesus. And while that is an important conversation to have, um, sometimes that's a pretty tough thing to take into your workplace, um, no matter where you, no matter where you work. I mean, I work at a Christian school, and sometimes, um, sometimes talking to parents about Jesus is actually not the easiest conversation to have. Um, and I think so. Support from a church looks like um, talking about what what being a day laborer looks like, what, what excellent looks like if you're a mason or if you um, program computers or, or how that works. I mean, for, for those that are, are pastors and, and church leaders, that might be a scary thing for you to try and engage in, um, but it's important for the people that sit and come and support church to hear uh, those things. Um, the second thing, I think, is that... Um, the idea of, the, of Christian faith being public and not private is really important. Um, sometimes we can get the message at church that um, I come to church for my own spiritual development and when I leave church I go home and read that passage again and it's just for me. Um, and it doesn't actually, it's not implied or it's not explicitly stated that it actually is designed to be in my public life. 
Um, and so explicitly naming those things to say this is not, um, our faith is actually diminished when it stays public, or when it stays private, um, and it's actually enhanced and um, uplifted when it becomes public um, is also an important piece to remember when we, when we talk about formal church functions. So we do have time for questions. Anyone would like to ask any questions for these guys? Do we have any question online, Elsie? Do we? No? Yep. Yep, sure. Um, hi, I'm Aubrey. Um, I found that sometimes my challenge in engaging with other Christians is that what it means to live a good Christian life is often prescriptive. Um, it looks a very certain, specific way. And I struggle a lot of times um, to engage wisely in situations that are happening that are just completely outside of what that prescription offers, if that makes any sense. And so I think my question for you guys is how... Um, how have you seen yourself engage creatively um, to live a good Christian life uh, when you come across situations that the, the church doesn't have anything for you yet, or I don't know, something in that? I'll give Monica a chance to go second this stuff. <laughs> um, I think the, for me, the, the biggest thing is just um, to ensure that whatever my response is, is thoughtful. Um, I've taken a number of opportunities just to say, you know what, I'm, I'm not sure actually um, about this. Um, really quickly, I had a student several years ago that would hang around after school um, and that's when I knew she had like a bombshell question to ask me. Um, and one of the things that she asked one time was, um, does God hate gay people? Um, grade six. And I, I said, okay, you just have to give me a second. Let me think about this. Um, and we sat down and started having a conversation um, about God and humanity um, and, and the narrative of God and his, his love for humanity and how that works out. And there's other specifics I won't get into. But I found out later that she'd asked that question because her sister had actually just come out. And she's attending a Christian school. Um, and so in having this conversation with her just now, she graduated uh, this year. Um, she said that space was actually just really nice. I didn't provide anything profound, I don't believe. I actually just allowed her the space to ask the question. And I think sometimes that's really important, is that we don't necessarily look like we have an answer or feel the pressure to provide one, um, but feel the ability to say, you're safe to ask that question. Um, and I'm gonna take it seriously. Um, but then it's up to, us, up to us to kind of faithfully look at um, our communities and, and what that answer might look like. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I had a conversation with somebody about what it meant to be a chaplain because they had been a chaplain for um, yeah for a number of years in their role, and I thought about what it would look like to be a chap to sort of adopt the posture of a chaplain, perhaps without the job title, but in uh, in my attitudes and interactions with other people. And um, I would just sort of say that in the particular cultural context that I work in, um, the relationship between uh, in between Christianity and Indigenous peoples is complex. Um, and that would probably be an understatement. Um, so in that role, when I'm sort of in that role, when I'm you know, listening with people who have shared about um, experiences perhaps in residential schools or sort of um, experiences that were very traumatic or very painful, um, whether it was in the past or even in the present or some of the systemic racism that they face today, I think about what does it mean to be like a, a Christ follower in this context? Um, when you mentioned that you know, a lot of these issues can feel like out of our depth and we don't have a prescription, I have found that a prescription isn't necessarily what people are looking for. And perhaps their experience with Christianity has been that there has been a lot of prescriptions without a lot of um, 
you know, without a lot of empathy. The, um, you know, the, the truth and reconciliation, as my indigenous colleagues remind me, there's, a, there's the role of truth and there's a role of reconciliation. Um, both are, you know, both are important and they're both sort of similar sides of a similar coin. So in that, in that moment, um, I'm inspired by just another, what it talks about, the Bible talks about mourning with those who mourn and rejoicing with those re who are rejoicing. I think about what does it mean to be empathetic in that, in that moment? I often don't really say a lot. I think about how can I be present with, um, with where they are? How can I sort of steward the space and uh, share the space so that um, people have the, so people can share and have the opportunity to experience what they're experiencing? And empathy does not necessarily mean agreement. There are, you know, I work with people who have very different, varying different attitudes around Christianity, and empathy is not always agreement, but it is an acknowledgement that when they're in that space, how can you walk alongside them, and how can you sort of see, see things the way, try to understand and see things the way that they, they do, with, this, with um, listening to seeking to understand, rather than listening as a pause where I think about my own response, my own arguments, my own rebuttals, <laughs> and listening as, as just the space in between that. So I found that, to be a, um, I found that to be a helpful posture as I've sort of um, worked with um, yeah, different um, Indigenous First Nations and people across the province and across, across the country. Hi, um, thank you very much. And um, it's really great to hear you reflecting on the public good, a really fantastic thing. The trouble with the public, the common good, is it, it, it can be very contentious, can it? Just what it is. You know, what is in the best interest of the public? What is in our, in our common interest? And that can really be something that, uh, you know, Christians disagree with the rest of society about. But it can also be a, a, a thing that it's just not, you know, it's not, not agreed politically within uh, 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 the culture, what's the good. Now, you both work in contentious areas. I mean, you know, education can be very contentious on this, and, and so can kind of environmental and um, reconciliation issues. So I, w I wonder if you could reflect on, you know, places where you felt in conflict, either with a Christian understanding of, you know, common Christian understanding of what's, what's in the public good, or with a kind of political uh, understanding and you know, where the, where the rubber hits the road for you. Um, if any of you have friends that have school-aged children in BC or you have school-aged children yourself, uh, you know that uh, the curriculum in BC over the last five or six years has undergone like a major overhaul. Um, I'd say many different schools um, especially elementary schools, are, are going gradeless. Uh, we're grading, actually not grading anymore, we're assessing on a, on a scale of mastery. Um, so if you ever, um, that's contentious, because how do I know if my kid's better than your kid if I don't have a percentage to put their name next to? How do I know that, like, my student or my child is, is going to, to leave here and get into the best university programs when, um, when their report card says something like um, proficient or extending. It's contentious because I think we all recognize that when we go to work, we don't get a letter grade or a percentage. And yet we look at our schools and we desire that. Um, and yet, at the same time, we can turn around and complain that, hey, what, like this kid's an A student, and we put, they get into the workplace, and they drive their boss crazy because they haven't figured out how to show up to work on time, or how to work in a group, or name any number of things. So now, lots of the conversations I'm having with parents um, and with administration and things are, how do we... Um, how do we faithfully assess student learning uh, in a new way so that parents still understand what their child is learning and how well they are learning it um, on actually a completely different scale than what their parents are used to? Um, Christians and non-Christians alike struggle with, the, with that idea. Um, we also struggle with things like 
Um, how does building benches for community organizations match curricular competencies? Um, and yet, when you talk to, when you show people pictures of grade five, six girls using chop saws and air nailers and things like that, they go, oh, that's really cool. Or, man, I wish I got to do that. Um, and yet, you can have super heated debates about whether that's an appropriate use of school time or not. Um, educationally, I think the biggest thing is how much time people take to actually understand what's going on. Um, lots of conversations I have, parents or other teachers will come in and they're upset about something, um, but really we just need to talk about how much thought I've put into what we're doing. The assumption is I haven't put any thought into it at all, um, and I'm simply just throwing it out to because I have to. Um, so lots of it is is just digging into what's actually there and supporting it in that. I remember in our second semester of MALTS, we spent a lot of time thinking about what were our spiritual practices and spiritual disciplines to sustain us in this marathon of, of leadership. And uh, certainly all of the, um, you know, all the topics that you've mentioned in your question, environmental issues, reconciliation, energy development, climate change, you, we can pick any one of those and there's probably a controversial, sort of a controversial topic, you know, just right at the tip of that question. So, but however, going, going to the, um, topic of spiritual disciplines, I try to remember that sort of I'm a co-participant and co-worker in God's larger working. Um, I think without that it can feel, it can be very easy to feel overwhelmed and um, so there's this phenomenon I understand now called uh, eco-anxiety where people actually actively have anxiety about the future, um, a lot of which are completely outside the scope of our control. And as I, you know, even in, in the work that I do, there's um, a lot of things that are outside of my scope of control that will impact my work, such as, you know, international legislative regimes, um, climate change, and the impacts on, like, oceans, and a lot of things that are outside of my control. But I remember the, the importance of uh, spiritual disciplines, thinking about why does the work that I do matter? How do I find ways to sustain and find inspiration and joy? Um, for me, this involves going to several of my pl favorite places in nature, spending some time in silence, spending some, some time in meditation. And this helps ground me as I go back into the workplace as there are emails piling and piling up into the inbox as people are talking through the email about how to resolve an issue rather than picking up the phone, as there's um, you know, news headlines that are just constantly bombarding our screens. And it can be easy to get sucked into that, um, but I do believe that there is a very valuable role of slowing down and building the disciplines in our life to help us slow down, to engage thoughtfully. It's a small window into what we're doing, of course, and you've had a little bit of conversation with two good people that we've come to love in the program. Um, yesterday afternoon, we had an hour-long conversation with the first, with the second cohort, which has started in July this past summer, in the first webinar. We have webinars twice between the intensive weeks in July and January, and uh, we've chosen to read novels for some of this interim conversation, thinking that, of course, mm -hmm. as Shakespeare taught us, the play's the thing to catch the conscience of the king. And so we want the novels to dig away at deeper, different kinds of questions for our students. And maybe a surprising uh, uh, news to you, we actually have to read about rabbits in this first uh, semester between times, and it's a story called Watership Down by Richard Adams from a generation ago, but it was surprising to hear the students yesterday as they were gathered in a Zoom conversation, of course, in screens from Singapore, you know, to Auckland, to Brisbane, to San Diego, to Seattle, to Edmonton, all over the place, really, uh, stepping in with their own comments, largely together, unrehearsed. I was surprised how relevant this was. I was surprised how, in fact, the work I did this past week, the conversation I was in actually today, reflects something that happened in this Robert Warren from this story of Watership Down. And of course, it's not a cheap thing we're doing. There isn't kind of a one, two, three, all rabbits do this, and therefore you should too. Um, but it's asking a harder question. These are these deep words that have given shape to the program, leadership, theology, society. And I could tease them out, but we have no time for that right now. But asking, as you think about the dynamic interrelationship between these ideas and words, and you listen to the story of these rabbit communities trying to work out 
what ideas mean for their common life, yeah. who's going to give leadership to their common life, what would the common life actually look like. And you can hear, of course, our words of weight, leadership, theology, society, being played out in these conversations with the students. We took an hour for this yesterday. We could have taken longer in some ways. I would have loved, really, to have them in a, a room together with something to drink together in a good fireplace, maybe in a late fall afternoon, to think, let's just talk through, of course, who these rabbits were and what they have to say to all of us today. Um, but that was the conversation yesterday afternoon. You can see in different kinds of ways we're trying to get our students to think through uh, questions which not only in Austin's good imagery here, have meaning for 60 minutes, but for 60 days and for 60 years, because that's really the longer vision we have for all those who give themselves to us for these two years of the program. Um, I'm going to invite Elsie Lowe to join us for a moment to wrap up our, our time with you and explain her part in all this and why she wanted to be involved in this too. So thank you, Elsie. We're so thankful this morning to have heard from our two friends, Monica and Austin, about living out their vocation in service to the common good. Now imagine the flourishing and good that can come about if a whole community of people was doing this together. Regent Exchange Churches for the Common Good um, is a new initiative at Regent College that is walking with churches to do just this. We want to see our neighborhoods and our cities flourish, and we want to see church communities flourish as they become more of who God called them to be, um, as they live out their vocations together. Um, and so this looks like um, churches um, coming along with us, and we coach them through a year of uh, a design process that helps them to develop um, a project that connects their vocations um, of their members to serve uh, their community and their neighborhoods. We provide different partners and resources uh, to help these church teams to discover about their context, to discern God's call, um, to design uh, a common good project and implement it with the help of some uh, startup seed funding. If any of this piques your interest, uh, you can do two things. First, you can head to our website to learn more about uh, what we do um, at rgnt.net slash exchange. Um, there's also an expression of interest form there for you to fill out if you think you're interested or your church might be interested, and we will be in touch with you. Um, or you can come talk to me. Um, thanks for being with us. Uh, this brings us to the end of our time together. Thank you for joining us uh, on our live stream as well. Um, we're going to close this time together uh, with a prayer from our friend Steve um, about vocations and for vocations. So if you will join with me, uh, let us pray together. God of heaven and earth, we pray for your kingdom to come, for your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Teach us to see our vocations and occupations as woven into your work in the world this week. For mothers at home who care for children, for those who labor for, whose labor forms our common life in this city, the nation, and the world. For those who serve the marketplace of ideas and commerce, for those whose creative gifts nourish us all for those whose callings take them into the academy, and for those who long for employment that satisfies their souls and serves you. For each one we pray, asking for your great mercy. Give us eyes to see that our work is holy to you, O Lord, even as our worship this day is holy to you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.